Space, the final frontier. This is the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. It's mission to explore the solar system, to seek out new observations and data, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. And now the host of the Observer's Notebook, Tim Robertson. Welcome to episode 78 of the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. I am Tim Robertson, the host of the Observer's Notebook and also the coordinator of the training program within the ALPO. Thank you for downloading and listening. The ALPO collects and analyzes observations of various solar system bodies and associated phenomenon and publishes detailed reports concerning these bodies in its quarterly publication, The Journal of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, also known as the Strolling Astronomer. This podcast depends upon donations from you, our listeners, to keep it alive. If you enjoy what you hear on the Observer's Notebook, you can donate to it via Patreon. You can give as little as $1 a month. If you feel even more generous, for $5, you receive early access to the podcast before it goes public. For a monthly donation of $10, you receive a copy of the Novice Observer's Handbook. And for $35 a month, you receive producer credits on the podcast and one year's membership to the ALPO. You can help us out by going to www.patreon.com slash Observer's Notebook. If you'd like to join the ALPO, membership begins at only $18 a year. For more information, visit us on the, visit us on the internet at www. Org. And you can also find the ALPO on Facebook. Just search for ALPO Astronomy. And yes, the Observer's Notebook also has a Facebook page as well. Just search for Observer's Notebook. If you enjoy what you hear on the podcast, please subscribe. That way you'll never miss another episode of the Observer's Notebook. And this episode 78, we're commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. So stay tuned. Join us, will you? All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Observer's Notebook podcast. Today we have a special presentation with Jerry Hubble of the Lunar Section. Welcome to the podcast, Jerry. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Um, I always enjoy uh, talking to you. I think we had one or two other, uh, maybe just one other uh, interview previous to this about the Lunar Section. Yeah, and that was a good one, too. I really appreciate you coming on. But this mm -hmm. time... We're uh, we're going to talk about the Apollo Eleven and and future Apollo missions uh, to the moon. Yeah, that'd be that's great. Uh, I appreciate that. So, a little bit about myself first. I I've joined the lunar section about four years ago, I think, uh, as a um, uh, the lunar uh, topographical studies coordinator, an associate, and then I was appointed as a um, as a lunar coordinator and I've really enjoyed this work um, over the years. I actually started contributing probably around eight or nine years ago uh, in a serious way, some of my uh, high resolution lunar images. Uh, but uh, Wayne's been a great help and getting me up to speed on everything. And um, I'm also, uh, my day job is I work for Explore Scientific Yes, you I'm the uh, I'm vice president of engineering uh, and the principal uh, engineer behind the PMC8 uh, mountain control system that we sell. And I've got one. Um, that's right. Uh, how do you like it? <laughs> I love it. That's I, great. I had some bugs with it when I first got it, but it was more or less operator error. <laughs> well, there's, it's different than most other mount controllers, right. and uh, it takes a little bit of learning. But, um, so that's my day job. I really enjoy the, uh, the iOS, uh, iPad, uh, interface for it though, too. It's really nice. Oh, good. We, we're still continuing to work on that system. It's, we, uh, it's a work in progress, but it's pretty, pretty rock solid now. We've, we've been selling it for now a little over two years. Okay. So, so um, so talk to us about this, uh, Apollo program that the lunar section has embarked on? Yeah, so last year, 
I guess it was in the summertime about a year ago, I started thinking about the focus on articles. And I said, you know, it'd be kind of cool to to write an article. Uh, the focus on articles, if you're not aware, come out uh, every other month. Um, and uh, so it just apparent, it just so um, so happened that the uh, in July of this year, that was uh, that was a month that the focus on article was going to be. Uh, you know, released is every two months. So I said, well, I need to write about Apollo 11 then. And then I started thinking a little further back. I said, maybe I'll count down to Apollo 11 by talking about all the landing missions uh, previous to that, or actually subsequent to Apollo 11, but uh, in, in reverse order, basically starting with Apollo 17. Uh, so I did that in September of last year, I think is when that first article came out. Um, and then every other month since then, I've been counting down to Apollo 11, and I just just uh, this last month, or this month, I guess Apollo 12, the Apollo 12 article came out, and the focus on, and the uh, and this this article is in the our newsletter, which is a monthly newsletter called the Lunar Observer, for the uh, lunar section. And I will link that in the show notes so people can get to it pretty easily. So, how many participants do you currently have in this program? So typically, we get it's, it's gone it's gone up over the last couple of years. Actually, we typically when I uh, we get around six to ten contributors every month to contribute um, images, and basically uh, that's what we like to see our members to. And we solicit all members, anybody that's interested in seeing their work published in our newsletter, they they uh, can send it to us. Um, and that information is in the Lunar Observer newsletter. You'll see when you go to those articles or go to that those newsletters. Uh, so anybody can contribute, and we, like I said, we usually get at least six to ten contributors every month. And um, the Apollo series that this year has garnered quite a few. Uh, it, some of them more than others. Uh, I think people. Um, look up, you know, there's, there's a couple ways to go about it. One is you can go look in your history of images. And if you find uh, one of the locations that we're asking for, for people to submit images of, then you can do that. Or you can just take fresh images if you're, if you're pretty active currently and you want to um, do a fresh image or some fresh images, then, then you're welcome to do that. And, this past few months, we've had, um, let me see here, I'm looking at my reference. <clears throat> so submissions typically for the focus on article are separate from the overall newsletter. So typically, there's, there's a subset of, of people that contribute directly to the focus on article, and we try to advertise ahead of time what the topic is going to be about a few months ahead of time. So... Um, for example, Apollo 17 article back in September um, had four contributors with 13 images and comments, and then Apollo 16 had three contributors with only five images, and then Apollo 15, which is a very uh, popular landing site because of Hadley Real, and we can talk more about that in a few minutes, but that had five contributors with 19 images just for the focus on article. And that's quite a bit. And then um, 14 had just one contributor with, with with 13 images. So they're very active. And I think that's the group that's over in Spain, Madrid. Um, they have several members that contribute as a group to uh, to our newsletter, and they contribute every month. And then um, this past uh, article, we had three contributors with eight images. So it's it's pretty good, um, and there. Uh, if, when you go to look at the newsletter, you'll see how nice these images are. Also, uh, if you're not familiar with high resolution lunar imaging, I think uh, you'd be surprised how how nice these images are, and, and what we can do from the ground here with our small telescopes. Yeah, I've looked at quite a few of them, and you've got some very nice. Uh, contributions to the section. Now, this this is a fun project to do. 
I mean, you, you could knock most of these out in a month, you know, the, these different observing right. the landing sites too. So it might be something for someone just getting into it. Now you're still accepting observations for Apollo 17, correct? For Apollo 11. Oh, okay. Okay. Apollo 11 is the next one, right? Okay, but if someone well, we accept then, we accept images from from anywhere on the on the lunar. So if they want to do their own sequence of images for all the lunar landing sites, uh, and contribute their comments and even an article, we have people that contribute articles separate from the focus on article. Okay. So if you want to do if you want to do your own uh, article on the Apollo landing sites and you have pictures of each of those uh, that are that you want to contribute, then Go for it. Uh, write our article and submit it to us. That sounds good. Now let's go through these one by one. Do you want to start at Apollo 11? Sure. Or do you want to count down from 17? Let's count down because that's how you did it on, the, uh, <laughs> on, on yeah. this site. So tell us about and, Apollo 17. Okay. Apollo 17 was launched on 7th of December 1972, and it was the last. Uh, manned mission to the moon. Um, the The mission lasted 12 days, about 12 and a half days, 12, 12 days and 13 hours, or almost 14 hours. And then they spent 74 or 75 hours, basically 75 hours on the surface of the moon. That's a long time. Uh, that's a, that's, that's, yeah, that's a little over three days. Yeah. So, and they actually spent 22 hours walking on the surface of the moon. So they spent, they spent a good eight hours a day, basically walking on the moon. Uh, that's a good day's work being in a, you know, in a, in a spacesuit, walking around the moon all day. And then you go in and then you, you try to settle down and get some rest and eat and everything. Yeah. that uh, It's kind of rem- interesting. Remembering back those days, I don't know how they slept. I don't know. I, there's no, they probably, way. they probably didn't sleep a lot. Yeah. I can't imagine you got, so excited to be there i mean it's got to be and the other thing is time's got to fly really fast Mm -hmm. you know when you're on the moon there so they had three had three evas one on each day um on the lunar surface they also had an eva uh when they were headed back uh or when they i think they were still in orbit around the moon before they headed back to the earth they had to remove um they had to pull things out of the the lunar module samples and film canisters and other right. things like that that they had to transfer to the command module right and i guess that stuff wouldn't fit through the hatch yeah is my guess i haven't read a whole lot about that um yeah, and right. so let's let's get on with the astronaut the astronauts <laughs> the mission commander was eugene gene cernan harrison schmidt was the lunar module pilot and the command module, the command service module pilot was Ronald Evans. Now, this is the only mission, Apollo 17, where they actually brought a scientist along. And that's Harrison Schmidt was a geologist. Um, and uh, they had trained several, I think a few geologists during the missions and they, if the missions had lasted longer, I think they had originally planned to go through Apollo 20 you know, three more missions after this, but they got cut and they were going to be extended, you know, geological surveys and it's great having, um, but they only got, they only got one astronaut that was really not a trained pilot or test pilot or a military pilot. He was a, he was a scientist and he got to go to the moon on Apollo 17, Harrison Schmidt. Yeah. Civilian astronaut. Yep. Yep. And, uh, so I didn't have a lot of details here. The lunar surface experiments package, all the, all the Apollo missions on landing missions had, uh, except for the first one had a package called ALSEP, which is the Apollo lunar surface experiment package, which included a uh, seismometer, uh, solar wind experiment. They had, they had a thing for drilling cores, uh, doing core samples, um, they also had a retro reflector to measure the precise distance between the earth and the moon, uh, that they bounced lasers off and they still use those today. And they also um, had a rover. And the rover. Yes, that's exactly right. The last, 
um, this mission was the last of what was termed a uh, H mission. Right? No, a J mission. I'm sorry, a J mission, which included these uh, the lunar rover. Uh, that started with Apollo 15. The J missions, those are the really extended missions. Um, and uh, so they were able to travel quite a ways on the moon, um, several kilometers during that three days. Um, let me see if I can find, let me see my. Hmm. My internet connection is not that reliable right now, but if you if you pull up that link for the NASA Apollo 17 mission that I've got there, which is the surface operations page, you can see and you can see more details about the, what they did when they were on the moon. Okay. The, um, so they departed. They departed the moon on the 14th of December, 1972, at about uh, 2254 UTC, and they splashed down back in the Pacific Ocean on the 19th of December, 1972, and that was the end of the uh, Apollo missions. And what was their landing site? Uh, they landed in the Sea of Serenity. Um, they're near craters like Poseidonus. Uh, Plenius, Dawes, Cleomedes, Macrobius, Romer, those those craters are near the landing site. I seem to remember Taurus Litro as the name of the site that they landed. Yes, that's right. Okay. That's Taurus Litro, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I didn't put that on our little sheet, did I? No, that's, I, that's brain cells. I think I remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> So if you're interested, the coordinates are 20.19 degrees north and 30.772 degrees east uh, is, is the exact location of this landing site. Now, do you recommend a lunar atlas or certain lunar maps for uh, for observers of the section to use? Yes, yes. I have uh, one that I'm – is my – my favorite that I use and it's a, it's a PC application. I think it's available for Apple and Linux also, but uh, it's called the virtual moon Atlas. It's an awesome, awesome program. It's got several different um, maps to display the moon different ways. It's got topographic uh, color maps. It's got, you know, albedo maps. It's got, um, and it's got a complete database of of a large number of craters down to one or two miles in diameter. Uh, it's got um, a couple of great tools. It's got an ephemeris. It's got a so you can you can display the the moon the way it would look at any time and uh, oh wow for probably a few hundred years I imagine. Is that a That's free app, or is it you pay a couple of bucks it's, for that? It's free. It's oh, absolutely fantastic. free. Wow. It's that's the yeah. It's absolutely. It's a great atlas, and uh, you can load in. It's got it's got other databases you can load in. It's got the lunar reconnaissance orbiter images. Oh. It's got the um, it's got the old uh, in the sixties the lunar orbiter images that you can load into it and overlay. And so it's a great resource if you don't want to study the moon and understand what you're looking at. And what's that called? Uh, I use it all the time. It's called the Virtual Moon Atlas. Okay. I will find it and put a link for it in the show notes. It's, uh, it's actually created by the guy that wrote, uh, if any of you are all familiar with Cart the Seal, the Sky Chart Program. Oh, yep, yep, yep. It's the same guy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, what type of uh, telescopic equipment would you recommend someone use that wants to be involved with this program? So, typically, uh, if you just want to do visual, any of the craters that, that we talk about in the Lunar Observer newsletter and that are in these, specifically in these Apollo uh, uh, articles, the Focus on articles, you can, you can observe all these craters that we talk about 
and around the uh, landing sites with a 50 to 100 millimeter telescope. So it's pretty modest um, scopes. Um, of course, the the larger the objective, the more detail you'll see. Right. But these craters are fairly large. And um, if you've got a nice tracking mount to where you don't have to, uh, you know, fatigue yourself trying to keep up with the moon, then it's great to just sit there and spend hours just uh, looking at these craters and just looking at them. You know, I did that uh, when I first got my tracking mount. I'd spend hours and hours just looking at the moon. There's so much to see. Oh, yeah. And it's people, you know, even I know people talk about well, it's the same moon all the time. Of course, it's the same, but the the changes in the shadows and and when the light changes, yep. you know, in a half an hour you can detect the light changing easily. Yep. And it other features show up a little narrow, especially near the Terminator when you're when the shadows are really long, you'll see little subtle features that pop up that you'll never really see except during that time. You know, you might have a half an hour to an hour to observe this feature, and then it goes away because the sun angle has changed. So it's, there's a lot to discover on the moon, personal discovery, you know, and learning what's there. And then, um, so that's always fun to watch, watch the light change. That's true. Now, Apollo 16. Okay. Apollo 16 was launched in 16th of April, 1972 at, um, 554 UTC. And, um, it, that mission lasted, <clears throat> a little over 11 days, 11 days and one hour, or almost 11 days and two hours, let's say. And they spent 71 hours, again, almost three days on the surface. Um, they did um, the same three EVAs uh, and then another one in space on their way back home to get the uh, transfer equipment and stuff. And, uh, and then they spent... 20 hours and 14 minutes on the moon walking around. And the uh, mission commander was John Young. Charlie Duke was a lunar uh, module pilot. And Ken Mattingly was the uh, command service module pilot. And Ken was uh, the, was supposed to be on Apollo 13. Uh, Apollo 13, right. He's got the exactly. measles. Yeah. Right, exactly. And John Young was the first pilot of the uh, space shuttle. Space shuttle, yep. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Real good crew. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you've ever watched any video. Charlie Duke's a pretty good character to watch and talk about the moon. Um, so they again had uh, the ALSEP lunar surface experiment package. Uh, something else that they did that the uh, the command module pilot, Ken Mattingly and Ronald Evans on Apollo 17 did, was they took, they did imaging from uh, in orbit and uh, they did uh, did a few other experiments. I think, I think it was Apollo 17, maybe Apollo 16 also. They actually launched a satellite from the service module uh, in lunar orbit also. Um, I don't know what the status of those, that satellite are uh, right now, but... They may still be going around the moon. Um, so they they did a lot of work up up in uh, up in orbit while the guys were walking on the moon. I'm sure I'm sure they didn't mind being up there. It was just the opportunity, you know. They didn't begrudge those guys on the ground not being able to walk on the moon, you know. Right. And how much time? Uh, how much time did they spend walking on the moon on on sixteen? Twenty hour, twenty hours and fourteen minutes. Yeah. Wow. And they were in the this the car region. It's called okay. the Cayley Plains, uh, the Lunar Highland. So the last few missions, actually from Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17, were to Lunar Highlands. They wanted to play it safe the first couple of missions, so to make sure that right. uh, they didn't get any any kind of uh, bad terrain or anything like that. But the last few missions, they focused on the Highlands, and uh, they were looking for um, they were looking at debris fields from like Mare Embryum. Uh, when it got when in, that impact happened, they wanted to see uh, pieces of that, and then also they wanted to look for signs of volcanism. Um, 
And uh, Apollo 15 is really kind of a cool uh, mission for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. The, uh, the landing site coordinates are 8.97 degrees south and 15.5 degrees east. And the the um, craters that are around that area that are near there are Ptolemaeus, Alphonsus, and Arzachel, which are the three prominent craters you always see right. near the first quarter. And those are the first uh, craters that I ever really got a good look at when I first started observing the moon when I was a teenager, or actually before then. They pop out. Um, yeah, they really pop out. And Rupi's Rukta is near there. Okay. You've got other craters such as, um, I don't know if I'll pronounce these correctly, Al- Alba, Tegnius, Klein, Hipparchus, Crater Herschel, Albolfida, and Delam. Uh, those are craters that are in that local area. And those are, you can see those again with a 50 to 100 millimeter telescope. Okay. And Apollo 15. Apollo 15, which is to and Mare Embryum Hadley Rill. This is a very interesting site uh, because of the location of their where they actually landed. It was right next to the rill, and it's cool to see these pictures. Um, so if you go to the um, let's see, what would it be? September, September, January, the January issue of the Lunar Observer's got the focus on article for Apollo 15. Um, there's, there's some great, uh, close up photographs from the moon, from the earth that we, that our members took that really show the rill and Mount Hadley right there, right in the middle of the valley where they landed. It's really cool. Yeah. It rills like uh, a canyon on the moon. That's, that's right. Exactly. It's like, uh, I think it's like a mile deep. Yeah. Is that right? And, a, and about six or 800 meters wide or something like that. Yeah, some of the most remarkable uh, images from Apollo came from Apollo 15 when they were driving around near Hadley Real and they yep. had a huge mountain in the background. That's right. Uh, so Apollo 15 was launched on the 26th of July, 1971 at uh, 1334 UTC. Uh, they landed on the 30th of July, 1971. So it was almost exactly a year. Uh, or two years since Apollo uh, 11. Uh, the mission was 12 days and seven hours. So it was, a, it was a little longer than the Apollo 16 mission. I think they spent a little bit more time in orbit uh, before they left for the moon. Um, I think they had a, some issues they were looking at or something with the spacecraft. I can't. I can't recall directly what it was. They spent they spent uh, 66 hours and 54 minutes on the surface, and then the uh, EVA time. They again they had three EVAs. Uh, it was 18 hours 30 minutes of EVA on the surface. Uh, the mission commander is David Scott. <clears throat> James Irwin was the lunar module pilot, and the command module pilot was Alfred uh, Warden. And Alfred Warden and James Irwin both uh, were on a Skylab mission yes. later on, yeah. I think, from what I recall. Yep. Um, so, and this was the mission where they first used a lunar rover. I still recall when I was a kid watching these missions. I remember them talking about it on the TV, the, the new lunar rover, and it was really cool to see that. Yeah, it, it kind of unfolded out of the... Uh, descent stage of the limb. It was, it was all folded up and the wheels you'd see pop out and spring out. and Right. Out. Right. So they were able to pack quite a bit in there. I think part of the, the early missions, they had a weight problem that they probably figured out by the time they got to Apollo 15 with the lunar, with the lunar module weight. Uh, well, they may have gotten better tuning on the, uh, on the Saturn V, also is where they could carry more, more, uh, uh, more weight to the moon, also, or more mass, I should say. Um, and this is the first J mission, which was the extended mission type with the lunar rover, and they had the standard ALSEP 
uh, package also Apollo lunar surface experiment package. Uh, they, the location for the landing site, the coordinates are 26.132 north and 3.634 east. And these are selenographic uh, coordinates. And if you get that, that lunar atlas that we were talking about earlier, the virtual moon atlas, it uh, plots, it gives you that data real time as you move your cursor around the moon images. It'll tell you where you're pointing at uh, in that coordinate system. Wow. That sounds pretty cool. I got to get that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's a few craters around, you know, there's Hadley Rill, Hadley Delta, uh, right there in the local area. There's craters to the north, Aristillus, Archimedes, uh, around the area, Autolycus, and some smaller ones, Conan, which C O N O N, and Galen, and Aratus. Those are some example craters that are in that area to see. And these craters, the smallest ones run down to around uh, 10 to 20 miles in diameter. That's why you can see it with a 50 to 100 millimeter scope because they're, you know, when we image the moon, we can, we can actually image craters down to around one mile, one and a half miles. But when you're, and so when you're looking through a small scope, you're not going to, you might see a little tiny dot where one of those one or two mile craters are, but you wouldn't see any details where these larger craters that are 10 miles in diameter or so, you would be able to see some detail on it, even looking through a 50 millimeter scope. Yeah. I was going to ask you if it's the same scope for all these. It sounds like it. Yeah, pretty much. The way I, I suggested this list was based on um, what you would need to observe all the objects. So some of them, the smallest ones, like I said, are around 20, 10 to 20 miles in diameter for, for craters. Uh, you'll be able to see rills and um, uh, even even uh, Rupi's recta, which is a straight wall uh, right there southwest uh, of Alphonsus and Erzikel. Uh, that, that is just, it looks like a, a vertical wall because of the shadow that, you know, it's got a really sharp shadow line. But it's actually pretty pretty uh, shallow slope. It's I think it's like twenty degree slope or something. Um, but it's only like a couple miles wide, and um, so you can you can see that kind of resolution even looking through your eye because of the shadow. Um, it's hard to it's hard to detect when you have near a full moon though, and uh, people will see that in a smaller scope. You can see it in a larger scope. Okay, so let's go to Apollo 14. All right, Apollo 14 was launched on um, 31st of January 1971 at 2103 UTC. The landing occurred on the 5th of February at 918 UTC, and they spent, uh, the mission lasted almost exactly nine days. Uh, One minute, it's only two minutes over nine days, which is kind of, Interesting. They spent 33 hours and 30 minutes on the moon surface, and they did uh, they only did two EVAs. Now this is this is the last of the H missions, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, they they only had two EVAs on these H missions. Um, Alan Shepard, of course, uh, you know one of the first astronauts of the uh, Mercury, one of the Mercury seven astronauts. He was the mission commander. And I think this is only the second of his space flights. He never flew on a, another mission after his uh, um, Mercury mission. Right. He had an inner ear infection and then became in charge right. of the astronaut. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And he actually hit so, a golf ball on the moon on a ball of 14. Yeah. I imagine he was thrilled to death to be able to get to, get on a, an Apollo mission. That must've been something oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of, after not being able to fly for 10 years or whatever, eight years, yep. you know, Yep. Edgar Mitchell was a lunar module pilot and Stuart Rusa was the, uh, command module pilot. Now, one of the interesting tools that they had on the Apollo 14 before they had the Rover, they actually brought some extra equipment and they had this, they called it the lunar rickshaw. It was like a little, 
uh, uh, I guess you'd call it a, a, a cart that they could pull around. Uh, kind of like a, um, what am I trying to say? A rickshaw. <laughs> what do you used to move? Move? Yeah, it's a rickshaw. I guess it's kind of like when you move. What do you move appliances and stuff with the? Um, a uh, hand truck type thing or hand truck. Yeah. It's kind of like that. I imagine I remember seeing pictures of it. I, I have to look and see. Yeah, it was like a wheelbarrow and they, that they pulled. Yeah. Right. Right. And, uh, they also had an ALSEP, uh, the Apollo lunar surface experiment package. Uh, and, um, they were at the Fra Mauro islands. So this was the first mission to, uh, the lunar highlands. So they were really looking for um, evidence of volcanic activity and also um, the debris fields from all these large impacts. They wanted to see debris from these different. So the thinking was that when these impacts occurred, it, it dug deep into the moon's crust and threw up really old stuff um, so that would be that would land on the surface and they could just go around and pick it up, you know, really old rocks. So that's, that was really the main thing there. They really wanted to understand the history of the moon and how it was formed. Um, there are quite a few craters that's from Iro is a large crater that's right next to where they, um, landed. Um, there's a bond planned, Gariki, uh, Perry is another uh, couple of names for craters. Gambart, Landsberg, and Reinhold are other craters that are in that local area. Um, the um, the landing site coordinates were three point six five four south and seventeen point four seven one west. Um, that's where that they landed at. Okay. So we're going to skip Apollo 13. <laughs> yep. They're not a landing site. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a movie. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and it would have been just like Apollo 14. What we just talked about. So okay. we kind of did talk about Apollo 13, but it wasn't really Apollo 13. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's go to Apollo 12. Okay. Apollo 12 is really a cool mission. So it was the first all right, so Apollo 12 and 14, or 13, 14 really, what, what implemented it was uh, was an H mission. And what an H mission was, was for high-precision landing. And they definitely proved it. Now, so before the Apollo mission, landing mission, uh, lunar landing missions were launched, we had lunar surveyors that were launched to do soft landings on the moon and to, and, and particular spots that um, they wanted the lunar modules, the demand missions were going to go visit. So every landing site, there was a surveyor mission very close to it pretty much. And Apollo 12 was the first mission that attempted to land near one of the surveyors. It was surveyor three and they, they hit it right on the, you know, right on the money pretty much. Uh, the Apollo 12 mission started on the 14th of November, 1969. And, uh, there was, so there was a, a year over a year, probably about a year and three months between Apollo 12 and Apollo 14, uh, before we were, because of the delay, uh, with the accident that happened on Apollo 13, they delayed the lunar landings for, for over a year and, uh, or for, I guess it was about a year between 13 and 14. But uh, so the, la the landing um, occurred on the 19th of November, 1969 at 0654 UTC. And uh, they spent 10 days and four hours on the moon and uh, 31 hours and 31 minutes on the surface. They did two uh, EVAs, just like uh, Apollo 14, and they spent seven hours and 45 minutes uh, walking around the moon. So they had some leisurely days, I guess, 
each of the EVAs was probably around four hours or close to four hours, and they were there for two days or um, a day and a half, I guess. So they had, a, so they got there, they got out, walked the first EVA, then they went to bed, and then the next day they did another EVA and then took off. Was the way that worked. Charles Conrad was the mission commander. Alan Bean was the lunar module pilot. What's that? Pete Conrad. He was quite the character. Yes, Pete Conrad. Mm -hmm. And Alan Bean was the lunar module pilot. And Richard Gordon, Dick Dick Gordon, was the uh, command module pilot. So they, so um, Pete Conrad. I wanted to nail that landing. And I think this is the all Navy crew also. Yeah. I think they I be- were all in the Navy. I believe so. And his audio after the lunar module pitched over is one of the funniest things I've ever heard. And I'm going to try, uh-huh. to, I'm going to try to add that to this podcast. Cause if you haven't heard his call of the landing, it, it was, it, it's pretty wild. That's cool. So, when they were they were coming down, um, they were trying to target where Surveyor Three landed, and I think it, near the near the end of the approach, they actually saw the Surveyor Three. There, it's landed. Surveyor Three landed in this really little crater. It's probably like a I don't know, a couple hundred feet across. It's called or maybe three hundred feet or something. It's called Surveyor Crater, and it landed in that crater. And and, and they they saw it when they were on their approach. And they called it out also in the uh, transcript. You, you can see it. But they they landed uh, less than a little less than 600 feet from the surveyor. So that's how precise their landing was. And it was so precise, which is the, the reason for it, is because they wanted to walk over to it and be able to get samples from the surveyor, clip off the equipment to bring back to see what I think it had been on the moon for two or two and a half years or something like that. They wanted to see what kind of impact being on the surface had on the, uh, on the cert, on the surveyor equipment that they clipped off and took back with them. The, uh, the patient was in the ocean of storms. Um, and the landing site coordinates are 3.012 degrees south and 23.422 degrees west. Um, the, um, I think we went over the EVA times and stuff. The uh, craters that are in the area that are that you can look for, Copernicus is north of there, probably around 100, a little over 100 miles north of the uh, the Apollo 12 landing site. There's craters Reinhold, Landsberg, Ptolemaeus. Apollo 12 and I think it's Apollo 12 and Apollo 14 are really not that far apart. Uh, You see but in the coordinates they're the same three degrees south and um, 12 is 23 degrees west and Apollo 14 was 17 degrees west, so they're only like five or six degrees oh, wow. in apart, which is really only amounts to like a hundred and some miles but on the moon's surface. Hugely different terrain. Yeah, exactly. So they were they were fairly close to each other as far as the uh, lunar landing sites go. Um, so there's other craters. So some of the craters that you see around the Apollo 12 region kind of overlap with Apollo 14. Um, you see Ptolemaeus, Alphonsus, also in one of the later missions, Apollo 16, I think, also uh, overlaps a little bit with Apollo 12. Okay. Um, now Apollo mm-hmm. 11. Where were you when Apollo 11 landed? Okay, Apollo 11, I was, so my dad was in the military. He was overseas in Vietnam at the time. So I remember we lived in Laurel, Maryland, near the Goddard Space Flight Center. And this is a cool story. Uh, I'm not making it up. This is real. My Cub Scout master worked at Goddard Space Flight Center. I was nine years old. Oh, wow. And 
he took our, uh, um, I don't know if it was a troop. It wasn't the whole troop. It was just a couple. It was like eight or ten of us. He took us to Goddard Space Flight Center the day Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Oh, my goodness. So we were there. We weren't in the control room, but we were watching the TV, and we were in that, you know, we got to see a lot of cool stuff walking around the Space Flight Center. And then uh, in the afternoon, they landed at 4.30 in the afternoon or something, Eastern time. I just remember being there watching the TV when it landed. And uh, that was the coolest thing in the world for me. That was just, you know, I was hooked on uh, the NASA Apollo program. And I didn't get to see much of Gemini that I recall. I was too young. Uh. Um, I think the first mission I remember watching on the Apollo missions was a was actually the first one, Apollo seven, the first manned mission. Okay. Um, in 68, was that in early 68? I think that's when it was, Yeah. but, uh, that's where I was. I was, uh, there, but when I got home at night, of course, the, the, when they got out, finally, it was like 1130 at night and it was late for me to stay up that late, of course. But, but, uh, my mom, we were, I think, there was a few people watching TV with us. I can't recall exactly. I remember my my mom, my brother, and my sister were there, and maybe a couple other people. But uh, I just remember being glued to the TV, black and white TV, watching watching uh, Neil Armstrong come out. Yeah, it's one of those uh, moments in your life that you'll never forget where you were at. No, absolutely. Yeah. It's just, it, yep. So that was cool. So Apollo 11 launched on the 16th of July, 1969, which happened to be my oldest sister's uh, birthday. She's 10 years older than me, which was kind of cool. And then they landed on the 20th of July, 1969 at uh, 2018 UTC, which at that time would have been uh, uh, minus five hours, was it four hours difference. I think it was so that'd be sixteen eighteen, which is four thirty or four twenty um, in the afternoon Eastern time. Um, the mission lasted eight eight days and three hours, about, and then they spent twenty one hours and thirty six minutes on the on the surface. Uh, there was just one EVA, which lasted two and a half hours. And if you ever get a chance on YouTube, you can find it. You can watch the whole thing. Uh, there's also a nice uh, website that you might want to link to that, that goes over all the Apollo missions. It's the Apollo uh, Lunar Surface Journal, I think is what it's called. It's a NASA website. It's got tons of materials on there. It's got procedures. It's got uh pictures of all their checklists it's got you know photographs it's got transcripts of all the missions it's got audio and some video it's got tons of stuff uh that's the uh, i think it's the apollo surface apollo lunar surface journal is what it's called i think yeah i believe so yeah i'll add a link to the show notes for that as well so that's a that's a gold mine of uh information if you're interested in apollo of course, Neil Armstrong was the mission commander. Buzz Aldrin was the lunar module pilot, and Mike Collins was the command module pilot. And uh, it's kind of cool. My boss, Scott Roberts, who's the president and founder of Explore Scientific, he's pretty good friends with Buzz Aldrin, and I'm just I'm just waiting to be able to meet him. I haven't had an opportunity yet, <laughs> but. Uh, Scott's my gateway into that, you know. There you go. Scott's a good man. I'm sure he'll hook you yeah, up. Yeah, so he needs to hook me up sometime. <laughs> yeah, I've met Buzz on a couple of occasions. He's a Have you really? That's cool. He's, a, That's he's cool. an interesting guy, yeah. I've talked to a couple of uh, astronauts. I'm At Neef this year, I met um, – I'm going to screw up um, and not remember his name now. Uh but I did meet uh, a few years ago in 2012 at, in Arizona at um, a show out there in November. I think it was in, was it 2012? 
Yeah. I met uh, Story Musgrave. Oh, great guy. And if you know Story Musgrave, he did the work on the Hubble Space Telescope. Right. right. To repair the first repair mission. Yeah, I've met him a few times. <laughs> He's he, he actually remembered me the second time I met him. Oh, before. really? It was That's like a cool. three-year period, and I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, man. It's a real cool He's guy. He's got a good memory. He does. Yeah. He really does. I was shocked. That's cool. So I got to talk to him for about 20 minutes. Um, we were doing an interview. He was at the Explore Scientific booth, and uh, he was talking to people. And I got to talk to him one-on-one for a few minutes. But when I first uh, introduced myself, I, it's kind of cool. Uh, I told him my name. I said, my name's Jerry Hubble. And he got this slight grin, and he looked at me and he paused <laughs> for a second and said, I I know Mr. Hubble. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. That's funny. So that was kind of cool, you know. That's... So we had a great talk. We we talked a little bit about his mission. I wanted to, you know, understand what it was like a little to train to be an astronaut because that's what I always wanted to be. Of course, if you grew up during that period, yes, a lot of kids wanted to be astronauts, exactly. and I wanted to fly and. Uh, be an Air Force pilot and then uh, be an astronaut. Um, but uh, that was cool, being able to meet him and talk to him. Uh, I think uh, Apollo 11. So we left off. They landed in the Sea of Tranquility near some craters, uh, some smaller craters named Sabine and Ritter. Agrippa, Masculine, which are right there. It's a smooth plane, very smooth, flat. They wanted to be as safe as they could on the first landing, not have any problems. Although it's kind of interesting because uh, on the approach, Neil Armstrong had to take manual control of the lunar module and fly over a crater that the uh, computers were flying him at. And, you know, it was a, that was the landing area that the computer was flying at the lunar module to. So he had to uh, take manual control and fly over that crater. I think the crater was like, uh, I don't remember the name of it. it might have been called Cone Crater. I don't know. That may have been the name of it. Uh, but um, no, that was in Apollo 14, was Cone yeah, Crater. It was 14, yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this crater was like the size of a football stadium, I think is right. what the way he described it. Right. And uh, that was kind of, so he just took, and so he, he kept flying and he got, if you hear Buzz Aldrin's voice during the transcript or during the audio, you can hear him talk about, he's giving out numbers for vertical and horizontal uh, rates of speed in feet per second. And you can see he gets going sideways pretty darn fast to get over that crater. And, and then the fuel gets down below a minute left of fuel. And, and I think, by the time they landed, they had less than 20 seconds of fuel. Yeah, the guys at Mission Control, they were panicking a little bit. Yeah, they were just kind of, like you said, they were holding their breath, waiting to see when he was going to put it down. Yeah, well, and I'm sure I'm sure Buzz was giving him some body language to get down on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Neil Armstrong imagine? was one cool character, though. He was... Oh, yeah. Well, he knew what he was doing. I mean, he, you know, he didn't, I'm sure, you know, their heart rates were probably fairly rate, but it's because they were excited, not because they were scared. Right. I think probably, right. um, I don't imagine they were scared when they were in this mission at all. You don't have time to be scared. You've got to concentrate right. on doing the right thing. Well, the, you, you have a job <laughs> to do. That's right. These are test pilots. That's right. That's great. Uh, Wow. So that's Apollo 11. Yep. I think well, I covered everything. Yeah, well, Jerry, I want to thank you for doing the research on this. That was Sure. We we've, we've been talking about doing this for a month or so and uh we got it mm-hmm. together and you did a fine fine job. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, thank you. Now, if people want to uh, contribute observations, how should they go about doing that? Yeah, so if you go to one of the um go to the links that that Tim puts out there for the Lunar Observer newsletter. And in the newsletter, about three or four pages in, you'll see um, a page that tells you about how to contribute or how to submit images to the Lunar Observer. Um, And it gives you my address, which is um, 
Jay, it's uh, Jerry dot Hubble. I think it's Jerry dot Hubble at uh, ALPO um, dash astronomy dot org. Um, yep, and then yeah, Wayne's the email is there. Yeah, is that? I think that's it. That's it. Um, yeah. And then Wayne's. So when you submit pictures to us. And your, we, we welcome your comments also. Please comment on your pictures. Please tell us uh, what you observed on the, on the, um, in the image, your thoughts on it, on the craters. Tell us anything you want to tell us about the thing. There are some things that we also like you to include when you submit images, it's kind of like uh, uh, some characteristics or parameters like the seeing what the time and date, what your location where you observed from, what the size of your instrument was, uh, what kind of imaging system you had if you took an image. Uh, if it's a drawing, we welcome drawings too. Please, if you're if you're into learning drawing on Yay. how to draw the moon, it's a great, great thing to do. Sounds like a project for some of my students. Oh, yeah. And uh, there's some great books out there. I know... Uh, Springer Books has a couple of couple of lunar drawing books out there. Other, I'm sure other uh, people do too. Other publishers, but uh, yeah, that's a lost art drawing. I started out drawing the moon um, when I was a teenager with my first telescopes, um, and I also that's one thing I did. I had a Polaroid camera. I was doing Polaroid camera imaging through an eyepiece to, oh, at the moon. Goodness. And those three craters that we talked about earlier, uh, yeah. Theophilus and uh, and Alphonsus, I could I got good good renditions of those. Although it was a it was a first quarter, you know, you could see the whole moon, but you could pick out these craters. It's kind of cool. Uh, they're nowhere near as good as what we can get with just a, a cell phone camera today. Right. Yeah, you know, but it was cool to be able to have a hard copy of an image through us. You know, my, my first, uh, this was a, I had a 70 millimeter refractor okay. on a tiny little gym mount that was manual gym mount. And so that's what I was using when I was doing my observing of the moon and the planets yeah. for when I first started. And when you go out observing now, those are the first three craters you look at, right? Well, I notice them every time I, even, even just looking at the moon with the naked eye, I can always pick them out. Yeah. That's like when I was in the training program in the seventies, I made like 200 observations of the crater Eratosthenes. And anytime I set up my telescope and it's visible, that's the first place I look. It's it's like an old friend, you know? Is that how you pronounce it? Eratosthenes? I always, you know, it's hard. These Greek words, you know, if you read all the time, you don't know how people pronounce them until you talk to people. Well, I've never been corrected. So that's how I say it. Okay, (laughs) cool. Well, Jerry, this is a lot of fun. I really appreciate, again, you doing all the work to do this research. And it's our sure. little way to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions. Do you mind if I uh, plug my books? Oh, by all means. I've got, so I've, I wrote two books, uh, both published by Springer Books. One in 2012 was called Scientific Astrophotography. And, uh, there's a subtitle to that. How uh, I'm not going to say that, but the next book was in 2015. It's called uh, Remote Observatories for Amateur Astronomers. Both of those are by Springer. And if you just on Amazon, if you just search uh, those names, or if you just search uh, Gerald Hubble, H U. It's not spelled the same as Edwin Hubble. It's H U B B E L L instead of L E on the end. Uh, you'll find those books, my books there too. And you guys have a pretty awesome remote observatory too. Yes, that's right. We, we have a, um, a remote observatory that's about five miles from where I live. It's called the Mark Slade remote observatory. It's named after a fellow astronomer that in our club who passed away in 2015, he left, uh, quite a bit of equipment. And instead of just selling it off, his wife decided to donate it to us to, and we wanted to build his, his uh, observatory because he, Mark was never able to get it done. Hmm. So he had collected a bunch of equipment, uh, a nice technical innovation dome and some other, uh, an LX, a 12 inch LX 200 scope and some uh, camera equipment, and other things that uh, he had been collecting over the several years before he 
finished his new house and then unfortunately he passed away. Uh, so that's who it's named after Mark Slade. Great. Well, Jerry, once again, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast today. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Uh, I always enjoy it. Um, right. Hopefully uh, we get some mm-hmm. observations sent to you. That'd be great. Yeah. Anything we can do to, to get, we, it's grown over the last couple of years. It's really getting pretty good. Uh, this last issue, we probably had a good 15 people um, submit work. So that's cool. That's awesome. All right, man. You take care. Thanks right, for thanks. coming on. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Observer's Notebook Podcast. I again, want to thank our guest, Jerry Hubble for his great research on the Apollo program and coming on to talk to us about an observing program that all of you can do with a modest sized telescope. So get out there and observe. We upload a new episode of the observer's notebook every few weeks. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. If you do, please rate and review us. I do appreciate it. You can listen to us on iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Google play, Stitcher, and Amazon echo. You can help support the podcast by donating to it via Patreon You can give up to $35 a month where you'll receive one year's membership to the ALPO and producer credits on the podcast. And with that, I really want to thank the producer of this podcast, Steve Seedentop, for his generous support of the Observer's Notebook. The link for Patreon as well as the link for the ALPO is in the show notes. You can contact me via email at cometman at cometman.net or on Twitter at at ObserversNBPod. Until next time. My hope is you always have clear and steady skies. Thanks for listening.